welcome everyone on, uh, if you're in Tennessee right now, this cold and kind of snowy afternoon. Hope everybody is doing well. Uh, my name is Matthew Sturkey with Stonemill Log and Timber Homes. A couple of quick housekeeping things before we get started with the presentation. As Dawn said, you're going to be on mute through the presentation so that we can get through it. And then at the end of the presentation, we will do a question and answer. I promise we will address all your questions. And if any of your questions don't get addressed, or if you have to leave early from uh, work or uh, for a personal reason, uh, feel free to, and then you can reach back out to your sales consultant who can uh, answer those questions for you. So we, we want to make sure that all your questions get answered, uh, but we also want to respect your time uh, today and be able to get through the presentation. There's a lot of information that we want to cover and uh, so we wanna make sure we get through it. But uh, as I said, uh, my name is Matthew Sturkey with Stonemill Log and Timber Homes. I'm a Vice President of Sales and Marketing. I started with Stonemill back in 1997. So I've been doing this, this is about my 24th uh, year, 24th, 25th year. And um, my specialty is obviously sales and marketing, but I've done you know, project management, worked in our fabrication facility, been out on the road. So I, I have a, a, a unique kind of broad perspective on uh, this industry and, and on our company. And today's presentation is not a sales presentation. It is more uh, of a uh, educational, informative, I'm serving today more as an advocate for the log and timber frame industry. So you're not going to hear me say anything about, you know, how awesome we are, although we are. We're not going to be talking about that today. We're going to be talking about perceptions within the industry and the facts associated uh, with some of those perceptions. And so uh, before we get uh, started in the presentation, Don, I'm assuming and hopeful that everybody can see my screen uh, as we go through the presentation. Uh, Stone Mill, we are a family owned and operated business, second generation. We started uh, our company in 1974. So this is our 48th year in business, so almost a half a century. Uh, we've got two years to go for that. Uh, we specialize in the design, fabrication and construction of log and timber frame homes only. So if you are uh, interested in a log or timber frame home, uh, you have come to the right place to get more information because that is our specialty. That's what we love doing. We've uh, worked with clients throughout the last you know, half century or so that have built primary residences, second homes, second homes as investment properties, investment properties that you know become second homes and then second homes that become uh, primary residences as well. So we've built a little bit of everything along the way. We do uh, primarily residential, we're about 85 to 90% residential, and then we do a little bit of commercial timber frame work uh, for local and regional contractors as well. So that's just a little bit of history about us. Um, like I said, our specialty is log and timber frame construction. So if that's what you're interested in, you have come to the right place. So uh, today's presentation is gonna be on perception versus reality. Uh, we're going to try to talk about some of the myths and some of the perceptions within the industry. Along the way, um, I'm going to uh, show you some photographs. Uh, and you know, at any point in time after the presentation throughout the weekend, feel free to go to our website, look at our photo galleries, uh, look at our floor plans if you haven't already. Uh, we've covered some of this about our uh, family history and, and what we specialize in and how long we've been in business and when we started. Uh, the goals of the presentation, as I said, are to talk about some of the perceptions and some of the myths within our industry and to clarify and talk about the facts uh, centered around log and timber frame construction. And I'm sure everybody uh, in, in whatever industry you're in, everyone has heard different perceptions about your industry and you've probably seen something online that led you to believe that, you know, something uh, is a certain way. And, and that's kind of the first part of our presentation is, you know, what, what is the difference between uh, a perception or a myth 
and a reality. And, and we're not going to spend a whole lot of time on this, but it's important to know, you know, perceptions are our beliefs and our opinions on the way we see things. So if I see something driving down the road, I see a home that's not in good shape. And, um, and let's say it's a stick built home. Uh, no, not picking on stick built homes, but let's say it's a stick built home and it's not been maintained. So my perception is that stick built homes have maintenance or vice versa. If you drive down the road and you see a log home and it hasn't been maintained properly and nothing's been done to it in a decade or so, then your perception is going to be, well, that log home is not in good shape and all log homes are not in good shape and all require you know, more maintenance. So we, we see a lot of those perceptions within our industry because people will put something on the internet or they'll post something on a blog and not, unfortunately, not everything that you read on a blog or everything you see on the internet is true. So what we want to, what we want to do today is differentiate perception or myth versus reality, which is the true situation that exists, the real situation, and actually the state of things around us and how things really are, not what we see things or how we see things or our belief of certain things. So we want to kind of dispel some of those perceptions within this, within the industry. So again, my, my role here today is to be an advocate for the industry and to be an advocate for uh, log and timber frame construction, because I'm assuming everybody that's here uh, has an interest in doing that. So one note uh, and a couple of interesting stats that I found uh, that I wanted to share. One is, you know, don't believe everything you see or that you read on the internet or that you read on a blog. Make sure that you get educated on the construction process and on what you're hoping to accomplish here. You know, feel free to contact homeowners that have gone through the process and learn from them. Go see homes, go see model homes, go see homes that have a little bit more age to them, not some brand new model that's built within the last 12 months. Because of course, everybody's gonna see something that's new and improved at that. Go see something that has been here for a long time. Um, you know, I love the fact that, you know, I'm sitting in a model home. We have three model homes here at our national headquarters in Knoxville. And the one that I'm sitting in was built in 1990. So it's, you know, right at 32 years old. So when you walk in, you get to see a structure that's been here for over three decades. And, you know, you can see how everything is aged and how everything's held up and how the exterior is held up and the interior is held up with, you know, proper maintenance. Um, so go see it for yourself. And then the last point is, you know, seek out professionals that understand how to properly build log and timber frame homes. And that would be the case for uh, somebody building a conventional stick and brick home. Make sure you are always seeking out professionals who are experienced, who have a higher level of expertise. That does not necessarily mean you have to find a builder that has log home experience. Uh, because we can get them educated on the process, but make sure you find somebody that is experienced in construction, has good subcontractors, and knows how to properly build things for longevity, for quality and longevity. Uh, a couple of interesting stats that I found, uh, you know, one is 97% of people read reviews of local businesses. So obviously there's a high level of people a high volume of people that are actually going online and researching, you know, 90% of buyers read online reviews and decide on, uh, you know, a product's purchase. So, you know, obviously we are a, a society that will use the internet as part of our buying decision. But as I said, be careful about what you read. Don't always just perceive everything you read as being reality and dig into the facts. Make sure that you're getting educated on some of the things that might be out there. More uh, importantly, some of the myths and some of the perceptions that are out there. And I'm sure there's a lot of perceptions in every industry. We're gonna talk about uh, our industry specifically. And the first thing that we're gonna talk about is log and timber frame homes require more maintenance. Uh, that is probably the number one perception or myth that we run into. I get uh, prospective clients that walk into our office 
and they've read something or heard something online or heard something from somebody that says, you have to replace the chinking material in the home every five years. And, th and that's one of the funniest one of the funniest perceptions I hear and that I've heard over the last, you know, 24 years of, of doing this. And that is, I got to replace the chinking every five years. And it's funny because when they walk into our office and I hear that we're sitting in a building that is 32 years old, that has the original chinking in it. And these chinking and stain companies have been around for, you know, over 40 years and they've been developing and making products that are built to last, that are designed and, and fabricated to last. So that's one of the funniest, uh, you know, myths or perceptions that I get that people have read online. And, and it's just frankly not true. So what we want to talk about today with reality, uh, all homes are going to require maintenance. Maintenance is not specific to the log and timber frame industry. Uh, maintenance is going to vary with every uh, homeowner and every site condition and every design based on solar orientation and shade and covered porches and overhangs and the structure, how far it is above finished grade and what finishes are being used. And I can't stress coatings and finishes enough when it comes to designing and building a log home to last and to not be uh, something that requires uh, excessive maintenance. So all of those variables play a part in how much maintenance you're going to have. Certainly, if, if you're going to build, if you're going to design and build a log or timber frame home or any home out in the middle of a field uh, on a farm with no trees and no shade, and no protection and you're not going to have any covered porches and you're going to have short overhangs and you're going to face that house a certain direction you know western face towards the sun you are going to have more maintenance than somebody who is in a wooded area with shade with covered porches with nice overhangs with the right finishes so i can't stress that enough because it's not specific to a log or timber frame home it just happens to be specific to any home and that's one of the things that we do a lot in the pre-construction design process is we talk a lot about maintenance and what materials to choose to help you lower long-term maintenance. And if you're okay with some routine maintenance, then you may want to do that, you know, a wood fascia and eave material, that, you know, hand-hewn fascia and eave material, or that board and batten siding in the gables and the dormers and then the doghouse dormers. Uh, for those who are trying to lower long-term maintenance, you know, we would talk about things like, you know, hardy board or hardy shake up in the gables or fiberboard for the fascia and eave materials. Some of those things that are going to last a little bit longer and not require as much, you know, upkeep per se. Um, you know, we always do things like two foot overhangs on our roof areas. Uh, covered porches are a really big part of log and timber frame uh, design and construction. So that is definitely going to help lower long-term maintenance. But as a general rule of thumb, we always tell people that, you know, maintenance for a log or timber frame home is more routine. It's not labor intensive. It's just more routine. It's one of those types of structures that you can't just let it go for 15 years. And really you can't let any structure go for 15 years and not have some repercussion from that. So we tell people that the typical not factoring in some of your extreme situations or you know some of your variables that usually about every three to five or four to six years is when you would typically want to clean and re-clear coat the structure and so if you're trying to figure out some you know rough budgeting numbers you know clear coat typically runs about uh, 350 to 400 dollars per five gallon pail most homes that are 2,000 square feet will, will require a couple of pails for the exterior, and I'm talking about exterior only. And then if you're one that likes to do some sweat equity, every three to five or four to six years, you might go out there and you know clean the structure, pressure clean it, and then you might be uh, putting that clear coat in a backpack sprayer and spraying it directly on the logs, uh, directly on the chinking. If you're using our chink profile, if you're doing a log on log profile, 
you know, you spray it right over the log. So that's kind of the general rule of thumb. Now we've got homeowners that have not cleaned and re-clear coated in a, a longer period of time than that. And then we've got some that have done it more frequently because of some of their site conditions and the design and solar orientation, uh, et cetera. Um, so a couple of, um, a couple of things too, as I said, chinking material, uh, we hear a lot of perceptions uh, you know, on the internet or in the industry and chinking material actually carries with the company that we supply the product for, which is Sasco, carries a lifetime warranty on it. When it is, it is installed correctly, uh, they know it's going to last. It has been designed and built to last. And, and as I said, our model home is a good example of that, the original chinking material from you know, 32 years when we first built the model. So uh, don't always believe what you read or what you hear. Um, the couple of links that I provided, we're not going to get too deep into those, but you know, when you get this presentation next week, you're, will, you're welcome to click on those links. And it talks about some of the general home maintenance, not about log and timber frame construction, but just general home maintenance for the housing industry. Some of these uh, links are to the National Association of Home Builders and how much to properly um, you know, budget each year. And the average is typically about $950 per year in budgeting. You know, there's a couple of different formulas that you can use. There's a square footage formula where you use like a buck a square foot per year. And then there's a, you know, a percentage formula where you use the percentage of what the overall cost of your home is. So however you do it, I would encourage you to, no matter what type of home you build, you know, budget annually. A maintenance is more than just, you know, finishes and uh, finished products that you put on the home. It also has a lot to do with keeping up with your home, cleaning out your gutters, making sure downspouts are cleaned out, making sure that you're trimming bushes and shrubs away from the home and making sure that nothing's growing into the house, making sure that your sprinkler system isn't, you know, spraying the, the home every morning and every afternoon when it comes on. So it's really important that all these things get done annually. And it's really important that you do things right the first time, as you can see in that link that we provided below, that we provided below. Um, making sure that you've got the right applicators and somebody knows how to apply the product correctly. This is not something that you wanna test out or test your skills with. It is something that can be done by owners, but you need to get educated on how to properly do it. So that link is, basically taking you to how to do it right the first time and what contractors to, to, to look for. And then the maintenance checklist below uh, is a, an annual checklist that we provide our homeowners on things to look for. And this is not things like, you know, restaining and re-clear coating. You know, it is more like, hey, each year, it's a good idea to give it a, a pressure clean, to just give it a bath, just with a garden hose or a little light pressure cleaner. Um, clean out your gutters, your downspouts, trim bushes away from the house. Those types of things are really important uh, to making sure that, that your home you know, stays at its tip top shape for many years to come. So that, that's the first myth, uh, you know, log homes require more maintenance. And the truth and the reality of that is that homes that are designed and built and finished and main pro maintained properly do not require more maintenance. It's more routine. And that is not exclusive to log and timber frame homes. It is, it is specific to the housing industry and, and homes that are designed and finished and maintained properly will be a good experience for, for the years to come. So that's the first one. All right, number two that we hear a lot. What about bugs? Has anybody ever thought about bugs and log and timber frame homes, probably more specifically log homes because timber frame homes, a lot of the times have a different type of exterior finish and the timber frame is isolated specifically to the interior of the home. Now, of course, with timber framing and log, you're gonna have outside timber porches and outside you know, timber accents and the gables and you're gonna have overhangs that are timber. Um, so it, it's not exclusive of just the log industry. It's it's timber frame house as well. So we hear that a lot. Uh, what about bugs? That's a, a common question. We've, we've heard that log homes are more susceptible to bugs. And that, that is 
frankly not true. The reality of that is that the housing industry, when it comes to carpenter bees and termites, the housing industry is susceptible to those things if things are not designed and built correctly. Uh, starting with carpenter bees, carpenter bees are just as likely, just as prone and probably more prone in conventional construction because you got more of it. So statistically, if I wanna find a stat that shows how many carpenter bee infestations are there in conventional homes versus log, I'll probably find more because there's more conventional homes out there. But what, what, it, what it comes down to is that carpenter bees in essence are just attracted to wood in general. And so some of the things that we try to do in uh, design and specifying materials for a homeowners is be thinking about some of those areas that are more susceptible. Porch decks, you know, carpenter bees love treated lumber because treated lumber is used and done in, in sap wood, which is the softer, softer wood. And so they love anything that's soft. They are less drawn to things that are hard, that are more durable, that are more dense. That requires them that require them to do more work because they're not eating the wood; they're 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 drilling holes to dwell. So, think about the right materials. If you're porch decks, think about treks uh, or something that is going to be less susceptible to that. Think about fascia and eave material where they, you know, a lot of times will attack those those places. Think about fiberboard there, something that's a little bit more dense, or maybe using hardwood finish if you're using wood in your uh, fascia and eave material, those are more vulnerable, vulnerable areas. Railing material is, tends to be more vulnerable area because what they like to do is they like to get up underneath something and hide from natural predators while they're drilling holes in the material. So you know, what we found in, in the you know, 48 years of business is that flat log construction tends to be less susceptible to carpenter bee infestation, primarily because they don't have anything to come up underneath because you've got a flat wall surface and they don't have anywhere to hide. So they typically don't go into a horizontal face. They don't go into a face. They like to go up underneath an area like a railing material or a deck or a fascia, uh, uh, an overhang or something like that where they can hide from natural predators and drill holes you know, to dwell in them. So. Uh, selecting the right materials and the right coatings. Uh, there is uh, what we call borate treatments that are used in this process that, that ultimately harden the wood and provide additional precaution against bugs and insects. Uh, but be proactive with uh, treatments. You know, there are uh, exterminator companies that do annual treatments in the spring that are very effective. There's traps that you can look at and then you can actually purchase online or you can make you know, yourself that are very effective. I've seen people um, literally take uh, brown bags and put um, um, uh, plastic bags inside of it and, and roll it up like a hornet's nest. So of course, carpenter bees are going to be, um, uh, they're gonna be turned away by you know, natural predators and a hornet is a natural, a natural enemy. So. Uh, you can also use natural remedies like, you know, vinegar and olive and almond oil if there um, are any areas that you want to try to prevent that. So, again, this is not a log and timber frame specific issue. This is a housing thing. Um, you know, I can tell you that from countless number of accounts and, and conversations with the homeowners that have conventional homes, you know, they have these uh, issues as well and in, in treated decks and and in areas like a railing material where they have to um, you know, do preventative measures for carpenter bees. And then for termites, um, that, that is a housing industry. And that is something that we spend a lot of time in and really try to educate our homeowners on. You know, termites are in, in essence attracted to moisture. So we always recommend gutters and downspouts to get the water off the roof line and into a downspout and then a good drainage plan and good drainage to get the water away from the structure. Make sure that your gutters don't terminate water around your foundation because that moisture is what in essence breeds uh, termite um, um, susceptibility. So make sure that that water, when it comes out of the downspout that you have it going into a drainage pipe and away from the structure 15 to 20 feet away from the structure. Make sure that you get the structure up off finished grade. A lot of times we'll recommend 
getting the structure at least 24 to 30 inches off finished grade so that you have some separation between finished grade and the log structure uh, or the wood so that you're not having that splash come back on the structure. Trimming bushes and shrubs. I see a lot of people that neglect to trim their trees or they trim or neglect to trim their bushes and the bushes will start growing into the house or they plant a vine up next to the house and they want this nice vine to grow on the house. That is a bad idea. Please trust me in this. Don't do that. Uh, so make sure that annually you're cleaning gutters out, cleaning downspouts out, trimming bushes and shrubs away from the house uh, because all these things are what creates moisture and moisture is what starts to deteriorate you know, structures over time and moisture around the foundation is what breeds and can be a breeding ground for, for termites. And of course, different areas of the country are more susceptible to things. You know, if you're down in Florida, you know, termites are a much bigger issue than termites are, you know, farther north. Um, so it's, it is regional uh, as well. And then, you know, obviously in construction, there are things that we do to try to help homeowners prevent these things. You know, we talk about soil pretreatments as part of the construction process and using FHA approved termite shields and proper flashing. Uh, but uh, those are just some of the many things that can be done to help eliminate that concern altogether. And then uh, I put a little link down there at the bottom for the US EPA. And what I tried to do is any of these links are more, um, unbiased third party. I didn't, you know, put links to blogs that were from the log home industry. You know, obviously I want you guys to be able to research a more unbiased third party like the NAHB, which is the National Association of Home Builders or research the EPA and some of these more neutral sites that, you know, talk about how to prevent these types of things. Again, in any home, not just log and timber frame homes, but in any home. So, Log and timber frame homes are no more susceptible to insect insect fest infestation than a stick home, especially if they're designed and built properly. And that is the common theme that you'll hear me say throughout the design build process is they've got to be designed, they've got to be built correctly, and they've got to be finished correctly. And then you guys have to do, you know, just the normal upkeep that you would typically want to do in any home. Um, you know, we, we as, a, as a society tend to procrastinate on keeping up our homes. And if, and if that's not you, kudos to you, because you want to do these things annually. You want to make sure that you keep up with these things, because if you keep up with them annually, you have much less work to do in the long run. All right. Um, how are we doing on time? We're doing okay. Uh, number three. And we're gonna go through five myths or perception a day. And there's probably 10 or 15 of them that we could talk about, but we're, we won't have time. But number three is log and timber frame homes are difficult to build. How many times have we heard that? Oh my gosh, a log home is so difficult to build. I can tell you folks, if, if it was so difficult to build, I'm not sure that we would be in business for almost 50 years. I'm not sure our industry would still be here. And, and I certainly understand that there are more conventional homes out there than there are log homes, but with the right design, with the right people, with the right experience, with the right support, this process is not difficult. It is just different. And that is the biggest thing to take away from this reality is log and timber frame homes are not difficult to build. They're just different. And there are some subtle differences that you do in a log and timber frame home that you don't do in a conventional home. One specifically that we educate our homeowners on a lot is settlement and how to allow for settlement and what is settlement and how often does it occur and when is it done? And that is something that we put into our engineered stamp plans. We put into our construction details. We have project managers that will support your general contractor or your framing sub on what to look for and how to accommodate for it and how to install it. Uh, you know, our crews, when they're out there doing shell erection and drying, will even show your contractor or show you how to properly do it. But you will have that support through our engineered stamp plans, through our construction details that are on the plans, through our construction manuals and through our project management and technical support, 
on all those log and timber related items. We want our homeowners to be set up for success long term. We don't want to just deliver a log and timber structure and get it dried in and then wipe our hands clean and leave you. We want you to have success all the way to the end. So there are differences. There are differences when it comes to settlement. Uh, there are differences when it comes to installation of cabinetry. Uh, there are differences when it comes to, um, you know, flashing details and, you know, how you uh, flash a log wall coming into a chimney. But those are all details that we provide support on and that we educate your contractor on. And again, if your contractor has some experience with log and timber construction, that's a bonus. If they don't, that's the reason we provide an engineered stamp set of drawings and construction details and a full service project manager to support for those log and timber related items so that he or she does those things correctly in the finished product. And if you're serving as an owner builder, that basically is the same thing. We would just be communicating those things you know, directly to you. So with the right people and the right design, the right plan, the right details, log and timber frame homes are not difficult to build. They're just different. And so that's why we educate our homeowners on those differences. So that's number three. Number four, uh, log and timber frame homes are difficult to insure. Uh, I get that one all the time. Ah, I can't insure a log home. Well, that is not true. Um, any home, it doesn't matter whether it's log or whether it's uh, timber frame or whether it's stick and brick, any home that's built in a rural setting is typically going to have more challenges. And that's where most of our homes are built is in more rural settings with a location that's farther out, that's not in the general proximity of a fire department, a county fire department. Sometimes we end up with projects that are so far out there working with volunteer fire departments and emergency services are farther away. And if you look at that in the insurance industry, that is one of the biggest things that's associated with premiums. It's not because it's a log home or a timber frame home, especially with a timber frame, which is really not a whole lot different. I mean, obviously it's very different than a conventional home, but you still have a lot of conventional you know, type construction and, and you have a lot of different finishes in a timber frame. But with any home that is farther out, you're going to have a little more challenge when it comes to insurance. You're not gonna have any problems getting insured you're just going to have a, a different premium set typically when you go to find insurance. So rural settings will ultimately affect rates. And then we we talk about choosing the right materials. Um, you know, metal roofing is more fire resistant, um, but you know, having a lightning rod protection may help to lower those rates. Um, choosing the right insurance company is really no different than selecting the right uh, general contractor um, and the people that understand how to do it. Insurance companies that have more experience uh, insuring log homes, that may be something that you try to find. It uh, doesn't mean that you can't find insurance through any insurance company. It just means you might find somebody that has a little more experience, you know, insuring log homes, just like you would want to maybe lean towards a, a lender or a lending institution that has more experience with log homes. Uh, you know, choosing the right materials, again, goes back to roofing material and uh, siding finishes and options on the gables and the dormers and what you know, materials you choose there will all have an effect you know, on, those, on those insurance premiums. And then, you know, of course, the common mis misconception is that you know, log, log homes will, bur will burn easier because they're wood. Well, when you look at the mass and the density of a log home and the fact that a log wall is a continuous construction as opposed to a stick wall that has breaks in it, um, log homes actually are harder and have a lower flame spread rating due to that mass and density than a conventional home. And that is because the size of the timber, and it goes back to that old adage, if you've heard, if you're, if you're building a fire and everybody that's on this call has probably built a fire before, if you take a big massive piece of wood and you throw it on a flame, you're typically, unless you've got 
you know, hot coals, that log is typically not going to burn very fast. It's typically not going to get started. That's the reason a lot of times when you're starting a fire, you're using small, smaller kindling and you're not using a massive piece of wood. Well, that's the same philosophy in a log home is it takes much longer, you know, to burn that piece of wood uh, than it does a smaller piece of, of material like a, a, a two by four or two by six. And so uh, I provided some links just so you, for those of you who like to read and get educated, uh, just some articles that talk about flame spread and talk about the density of wood and how it is advantageous for fire resistance. That does not mean that if you know, a fire burns in a log home for three or four hours that it's not going to burn. That, that's, that's not what I'm saying. I'm just talking about some of the perceptions in, in general, some of the myths in general that, you know, log homes are more likely to burn than a conventional home. That is not true. And you can, you can validate that from some of these articles that I provided from uh, the NHP. So that's number uh, four. Number five is one that we talk about a lot that um, log and timber frame homes are not energy efficient. Well, I'll go ahead and say right now, timber frame homes, because of the way that timber frame structures are built, and I'm not sure how much you are familiar with timber frame homes and how aware you are of those. And, it, and I'm not gonna get into a, a presentation on log versus timber frame, but a timber frame structure is typically isolated to the inside of, of the shell of the home. And the outside of that timber frame is typically done with what we call a structural insulation panel, or it can be conventionally framed to the outside of the timber frame and then insulated traditionally with a bat insulation or spray foam uh, like you would typically see in a conventional home. So a timber frame is technically two structures in one, and the timber frame structure itself is mostly to the interior of the home. That's where it's mostly visible. Uh, obviously you have exterior uh, visibility on your overhangs and your covered porches, et cetera, but those are areas outside the envelope are not insulated. So where I'm going with that is timber frame homes, you can read anything you want and you will always find that timber framing is one of the more energy efficient ways to build one of the more energy efficient types of construction and that's because of the use of those structural insulation panels around the frame itself so we're not going to get into um you know a discussion about log versus timber frame I'm, i say that because when you talk about energy efficiency of a log and timber frame home you kind of have to separate those because timber framing it is extremely energy efficient with sit panels with high r values uh, but some of that and a lot of that carries over to log construction as well, because in our case, for example, we're doing log wall construction and, and log wall construction is the use of logs for your structural perimeter walls. So they kind of serve as as a dual function. Not only are they the finish wall, but they're also your structural wall and your insulation as well. And it goes back to that thermal mass property much like we talked about in the fire rating where the size of the log, the density of the log is what gives you that energy efficiency property called thermal mass and is what makes a log home you know, energy efficient and more energy efficient than you would, you would typically think. Uh, it's also a continuous construction, so there's no breaks in it. Uh, somebody was showing me a picture, I think actually it might've been Dawn, was showing me a picture the other day of a conventional home where the sheathing in the corners and the sheathing in the gables and in the roof wasn't even touching each other. So you could see daylight coming out of the roof and coming out of the walls. Now, of course, eventually that will get Tyvek and it will be, it'll get covered, but you still have gaps there. And that's one of the things we talk about in energy efficiency is a function of how well the house is built and how well it is finished and how well it is sealed and caulked and stained and chinked and how well it is maintained. The performance of a house is a function of how it's designed and how it's built and how it's finished. And that is across the board. 
that is not just specific to log and timber frame homes. That is across the board. So that's the reason we always preach making sure that you're choosing the right materials and that we're designing it for the location that you're building in. So if we're designing a structure for a homeowner in Tennessee, we're going to build a different structure than if we're building for a client up in Pennsylvania or Massachusetts or up in you know, Wisconsin. We will have probably a thicker log wall. We're gonna probably have a higher R value in the roof system as a minimum. You know, and so that's the reason log homes a lot of times are very energy efficient because we're using you know, timber frame construction on the roof and we're doing structural insulation panels, which typically in this area have a minimum R30 R value. And when we get up into colder climates and farther north and in higher altitudes, we'll go into R50, R49, R50, and, and everything will be designed specifically for that location. There's not a one size fits all. So how it's designed, how it's specified, you know, how everything is spec'd out for your insulation values for different parts of the house. Uh, we do what we call a res check, which is a residential energy study calculation that shows the structure meets and exceeds the energy code requirement in the area that you're building in. So um, again, that's the myth that log and timber frame homes are not energy efficient. The reality is that they are, especially when you're comparing apples to apples on you know, wall thicknesses and insulation values and those types of things. And I provided that link on uh, energy performance of a log home from NAHB so that you could get a little bit more educated you know, on that as well. Uh, so that's the, the last myth that we're gonna talk about today. Um, before you know, we go to Q&A, just a couple of final remarks. And, 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 and as I've said several times, and I, I apologize for sounding like a broken record, but any home is going to be only as good as it's designed, you know, engineered, built, and finished. You know, that is true for conventional homes, log homes, timber frame homes. If it's not designed right, if it's not finished right, if it's not, you know, sealed correctly, uh, if your coatings are not applied right, your caulking products are not applied right, um, it is not going to be as energy efficient as it can be. So that's the reason that design, you know, choosing the right materials, choosing the right contractors and subcontractors that do things correctly, holding those them accountable, designing everything specific to your location and to your local energy code requirement is so important in this process. And so a lot of the work we do is all on the front end before we go into construction, making sure it's designed and specified correctly. And then the second thing, and I've said this a couple of times too, just don't believe everything that you read. Don't you know, perceive something as reality until you can get educated on something, making sure that you're talking to people who have been through the process. You know, I don't think that we would have as many homeowners as we do, and I don't think that we would have been in business as long as we had, and I don't think our industry would have been around as long as it had if we were building poor quality, uh, not you know, non-energy efficient homes that were um, um, you know, hard to insure and tough to maintain. You know, I think, uh, of course, in any, uh, anything you do in any industry, you can find negative reviews. Everybody's going on there. And, and I think you're, you're far more likely to post something negative than if you have a positive experience. Uh, I think you're actually nine times more likely to post something negative. So again, get educated on that. Don't believe everything that you read. If you see a negative review, dive deeper into it. Talk to the suppliers that you're talking to uh, about some of those things, some of those concerns. Get them out there on the table. Go talk to homeowners. Go tour model homes that have been built for a longer period of time, not something that's just been built within the last 12 months. And just get more educated. Do your homework. Do your due diligence. Just don't believe the first thing that you read or the first thing that you hear. That's ultimately where perceptions come from and where some of these myths are created about log and timber frame homes or about certain industries. So uh, that would be my um, encouragement to you uh, is to get educated, get educated on what you're doing. So hopefully uh, 
We've gotten done in 45 minutes. That's what we were shooting for, trying to keep everything within an hour. I know it's a lot of information to try to take in. I'm sure there's other myths out there that you've probably heard before. And in fact, if you go online, I'm sure you'll find you know 10 or 12 or 15 of them. Uh, if you have questions about any of those concerns, uh, you would like to have a, a very uh, you know upfront conversation about cost or energy efficiency or any of that, feel free to call us because that's what we, there are no stupid questions. We want to address these things and get our homeowners comfortable with the process moving forward. So um, that is it for the presentation. I'm gonna open the floor to questions and um, to answer those questions for you. Like I said, if uh, some of your questions don't get answered because you have to leave or you're afraid to ask them, in a group setting like this, uh, you're welcome to send them to us directly. Um, and also Dawn is going to send out this presentation uh, probably Monday, does he yeah. think Monday was safe? Uh, and it'll have all these links in there that you can click on and go and look at and, uh, and get more educated on some of these, some of these items. So uh, thanks again for your time today and we'll open the floor for questions. I think Dawn's gonna go ahead and just, just uh, um, just pose those questions as they come in. Okay, so we have a couple questions. Um, I know some of these questions actually can be answered by watching some of our previous Lunch and Learns. Um, so some of these aren't really pertaining to the myths, but I'll go ahead and start. Uh, Matthew, we have a question about a purchasing property. Uh, does Stone Mill have building sites or do the customer typically purchase their own property first? So um, typically a homeowner will purchase their property first before they come to us. Um, you know, if you're looking for property in this immediate area, in the Knoxville and surrounding area, uh, we can certainly, we have kind of a land assistance service that we can help you with. And so if you are building more in our local, uh, you know, uh, national headquarter area, we can certainly help with that. But we don't uh, go out and purchase properties and sell them internally, you would go out and find, because we've got, you know, I think 87 people or so registered on this Lunch and Learn. And I, I think there's probably 20 states represented. We've got people from Massachusetts and Pennsylvania and Florida and Colorado. And, you know, it would be really difficult for us to um, go out and purchase properties for sale in all those different areas. So you would actually seek out a local real estate agent. There are some uh, companies that specialize in land acquisitions and transactions. Uh, there's a company called National Land Realty. They're a national real estate company that that's focuses on land. Uh, there's a company here local called Whitetail Properties. There's Mossy Oak Properties. There's a few real estate agencies around the country that specialize in land. And those are the ones that I certainly would encourage you to seek out. Uh, ones that are looking and helping you find land only, not looking at pre-existing homes. However, if you've got a real estate agent in your local area that you trust and you're comfortable with, uh, they can also go out and help you find property as well. And uh, great question, because here in the next four weeks, we're going to be doing a four-part series, a Tip Tuesday series on finding the ideal land. So if you aren't joining us or aren't following us, on YouTube and watching some of those Tip Tuesdays, we'll be doing a four week series on that subject alone uh, about finding the ideal property. All right, um, we also have a question about, uh, does Stonewall provide services to subcontract the project from start to occupancy? So again, that's a more, uh, location or geographic thing. Uh, so Stone Mill uh, works in conjunction with um, locally with Peloton Construction. That uh, service radius is about 50 miles from uh, the Knoxville area, uh, 50 miles you know, in any direction surrounding Knoxville. But we don't provide turnkey services you know, outside of that 50 mile radius, that, primarily because logistically it would be too difficult and too cost prohibitive for a homeowner of ours, you know, if we were trying to turnkey a home in Pennsylvania and trying to manage that. 
um, you know, we would just be hiring a local uh, resident in Pennsylvania, a project manager, all the materials would come locally, but we would have to come up there periodically to check on progress and make sure quality was the, um, you know, the level that we're expecting it to be. So you would typically, outside of our location, you would typically uh, find a local GC who would do all the foundation and finish work and then Stone Mill and Creekside, which is our construction entity, uh, would come up and do the shell construction. What we specialize in is uh, designing, uh, engineering, fabricating, and constructing all the log, the unique log and timber components. So we work in conjunction with the local general contractor that you hire in the area that you're building. Does that thumbs up if that answers the question? I think that's good, Matthew. And it we have quite a, a array of questions here. So I'm going to try to see if there's any that are, there's two questions on cost per square foot. Um, I know that's, that's something that comes up a lot. Um, and this person has asked, what is the cost per square foot estimate for a log home, not including shipping to the location? Um, do you furnish the roof, subfloor, um, and, you know, and finished flooring? So that's, so it's something where they're like, what comes with it for the price, I guess, is what they're asking. Yeah, so the, 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 the reality and the right answer is, I don't know what it's going to cost to build your home. And anybody who tells you what the cost is without having a design specific to your property and site elevations and floor plans and a foundation plan and subfloor plans and finished specifications, and they've gone out to a general contractor and that GC has gone to all his subs to get written estimates on exactly what you want to put in from your finishes to your fixtures to your countertops and your cabinetry. Nobody's going to know what that cost is. It's a custom build. It is all based on you, your choices, preferences, your design and your site and the GC you choose and the location that you build in. There are different areas of the country, pockets in the country that typically are a little more expensive than others. You know, there are places out in Colorado like Aspen and Breckenridge, and there's places in North Carolina like Boone and Banner Elk and uh, Highlands, North Carolina, which tend to be a little more expensive for construction because the market will bear, you know, that going rate. So the, the, the reality is, is that I can't give you a number I can give you a ballpark, but it's just that. And that is another myth that we run into. And that is, you know, log and timber frame homes are more expensive than conventional homes. Well, most of the homes that we build, because of the finishes that people put into them, and it's their primary residence, and they're doing wood floors throughout, and they're doing high-end roofing material, and they're doing high-end finishes, you know, tend to be more expensive than the average home. Uh, they certainly are going to be more expensive than a conventional stick home that has vinyl siding on the outside, stucco on the foundation walls, and drywall on the interior, and wall-to-wall -wall carpet. You know, if you're comparing those two, you are not comparing apples to apples. That is not a fair comparison with a custom high-end log and timber frame home. However, I will tell you that I've had plenty of homeowners in the last 24 years and we have had plenty of homeowners in the last 48 years that have built their homes economically by serving as an owner builder or choosing the right finishes and fixtures and not doing stuff that's super high end and building uh, structures on lower levels and finishing out square footage in the basement that's more economical and doing drywall and carpet and things down there that, you know, that are more normal. Um, so it's all a function of finishes and fixtures. I mean, that's you know, really a conversation, you know, I would rather not throw out some blanket number, you know, until we've had a conversation about where you're building, what design you want, what finishes you're looking at, so that we can get a better feel for what direction you're trying to go. Um, because otherwise, I'm giving you a blanket number that, you know, will be, a, again, another perception. It's like, hey, until you actually have a design and you know what finishes, you know where you're building, you know what your property is. I'm looking this afternoon, I'm going to meet with a prospective client that's got an offer on a piece of property up in uh, Wares Valley. 
And this property literally is a 30 to 35 degree slope and he wants to build up on top of the mountain. I, I mean, I'm going to encourage him to continue to look for a different piece of property. And those are things that contribute to high cost of building. It doesn't matter what you're building, whether it's a stick home or a log home or a timber frame, those are the types of things that will elevate cost per square foot and construction costs. And you also got to think about the market right now, you know, framing lumber, sheathing, conventional building materials are typically more expensive right now than they've ever been. And that's the reason a lot of our clients are doing log and timber frame because they can better justify it because our industry hasn't seen nearly the increases as a, as a percentage. We've seen increases, but not as, as, as high of a percentage as the conventional housing lumber market with framing lumber and sheathing and conventional building materials. So hopefully I know that doesn't answer the question and I apologize. I'm happy to have a specific conversation with you on that specific issue. And we've got a lunch and learns that we've done in the past presentations we've done that have talked specifically about cost per square foot and that have talked about budgeting and they go more in depth and they're a 45 minute out 45 to an hour hour long presentation i would really encourage you to go look at those watch those in your free time uh, when you have a chance because that's going to better answer that question okay matthew um we're trying to get through a couple more of these questions before we're finished um, so on the interior walls, um, you know, you talked about doing maintenance. Do you have to treat the interior walls of a log home every four years? No, okay. no. Um, our model here built in 1990, uh, you know, we do actually a bi-monthly cleaning. We clean twice a month um, and we do the normal cleaning, cleaning floors and dusting, but we've never resealed, clean the walls. We've never, I mean, certainly if you are a clean freak and you want to vacuum your walls, you're more than welcome to. But ultimately with a flat log face, that is an easier home to clean on the inside than you would typically find, find with a round log. And again, I'm not trying to hit against round logs, but that round log has an upper curvature that can collect dust. So our homeowners who have lived in round log homes before that have moved over to a flat log, uh, that is one of the reasons they did it is because they had a little bit more cleaning on the inside because of that upper curvature of that round log holding dust. Whereas with a flat log, it, there's nothing for it to hold on. They Dust will collect on flat surfaces, not vertical surfaces. Um, so you don't have to do, I mean, we typically on the initial application, the initial construction, your contractor, your applicator will apply uh, uh, exterior stains and clear coats to the uh, exterior of the structure. Uh, and then on the inside, they'll uh, you know, clean everything just like they do the exterior initially. And then they'll uh, apply stains and a clear coat. And that clear coat is a one-time application. I, I have never had a homeowner tell me that they re-clear coated the inside of their home in the 25 years I've been doing this and in the 48 years that we've been in business. That is just not something that you typically see. That doesn't mean you don't wanna change colors or you don't wanna freshen something up. That's totally different. That's like painting a wall. Uh, you know, we've, we've changed chinking colors and there's a product called chink paint. You know, if you wanna go from a gray to a white or to a beige and freshen the room up 10 or 15 years down the road, you can certainly do that, but there is no maintenance on the inside of a log home or a timber frame. It's just normal upkeep, normal normal cleaning. All right, Matthew, I'm gonna combine these two questions together because um, they're kind of similar. Are log home builders typically a sub to a GC and who is responsible for meeting the local codes and what are good resources to find general contractors to manage a log home build? Okay, do that question in two parts for me again. Okay. I'm, I'm so, not smart enough to remember that whole thing. <laughs> that's okay. We'll just see the first give me, part. <laughs> give, me a two, give me a first question and a second question. Okay. Um, are log home builders typically a sub to a general contractor? And if so, who is responsible for meeting the local codes? Okay. All right. So are, are log home builders, I'm assuming when you're talking about log home builders, you're talking about a subcontractor. So in that case, 
let's take uh, Stone Mill Creekside, for example. Stone Mill, we are a provider of uh, designed, uh, pre-engineered, prefabricated log and timber frame structures. And then Creekside, which is our construction company, is a subcontractor who goes out and builds the log and timber shell that dries it in, that does the unique construction for the home. We're not doing, if we're outside of our local radius, we're not doing turnkey construction in Pennsylvania. So we would partner with a local GC. The local GC would take our engineered stamp drawings, put a foundation in, put subfloor in, put porch decks in. We would come in and build the log and timber frame shell, the skeleton, get it erected and dried in, and then turn it back over to the local GC. So in that scenario, we are a subcontractor to the GC. And the GC would take our engineered stamp set of drawings for the area that they're building in to the local code that they're building and go to that codes department to pull a permit, to pull a permit in your local county or your local municipality. And so ultimately the general contractor is responsible for making sure that all the subs are building to the local code and meeting the local code and the plans are designed and engineered to that same local code as well. So technically that falls on the general contractor. That's his responsibility to pull the plan, to pull the, per I'm sorry, pull the permit and then manage subs that are building to that engineered stamp set of drawings, you know, to local code. If you are not hiring a GC and you're doing an owner build project, where you're serving as the GC, then that falls on you to pull the permit and to make sure all the subs are building to that plan and to that into that local code. So did that answer both parts? Yeah, and then uh, resources for getting a general contractor um, for a log home specific. Uh, again, I, that's probably a you know thirty minute conversation or a thirty minute answer. Um, I would say. First and foremost, go watch our uh, Lunch and Learn on finding a GC, what to look for. Uh, certainly resources in your area are gonna be specified and shown in that presentation. But in short, uh, the NAHB, your local NAHB would have a list of contractors. Your Chamber of Commerce would probably have a list of recommended contractors. If you're building in a development, your developer or your HOA will have a list of preferred contractors. You know, interview them, talk to several of them, you know, make sure you're comfortable with them. But um, uh, uh, Rob did a, a lunch and learn last year on finding a GC. We've got Tip Tuesdays on it, but that, that lunch and learn is about a 45 minute presentation on exactly what to look for. And I think that would be very helpful for you to, to watch and listen to, um, to get more information on what you're looking for. Mm -hmm.